talking about A and hardware. Which is the most important point of A and hardware? The right side, not the bolt size. What does that mean? Right. Don't look at the wrench. And if a guy wearing jammies in class can tell you, you remember that. Then he's got a onesie on. It's not jammies. He's a onesie. All right. So we, we, we've worked our way through uh, bolts and we started working on nuts. And, and we went through the, the 365, the uh, AN3, AN 365 or the MS 2365s. The low temp. Low temp. And why is it called low temp? Nylon. nylon will melt out at? 250. So don't use them around the engine. So I said I don't use them forward of the firewall, which is the firewall is the uh, stainless steel piece for the engine. So I don't use them in the engine compartment. Is it wrong if you use it in the engine compartment? Not really, because not everything gets that hot. There's some stuff up there that actually stays pretty cool, but you know, it's just a rule of thumb. If you can keep from doing that, that's great. So you have the, the, the tall ones, which are? Tension. Tension, very good. And you have the shorter ones, which are? Shear. Shear. Notice there's not very many threads in there. So if you get confused and you try and torque this to the tension, it will get loose. So the threads will rip right out. It happens every year to somebody in the little like torque project. We would have, oh, that was the Aero 309 project I had for torquing. It's like, how come nobody's doing that? All right, so we did that, prevailing torque. All right, which brings us to the high temp, or shall we say not so high temp, because it's only good up to 450. What happens after 450? They get brittle because the cab plating bakes into it and they get very brittle. So this is where we left off with, with high temp. Let me see what was the next one. Oh, that's another type of high temp. These are kind of weird in that, notice how the, the it takes a much smaller wrench right here. These can be really cool sometimes because you have very limited space where you're working. And if you use one of these, it's I just call it a reduced diameter uh, nut. Um, so you can see it's a normal size around the base, but it takes a smaller socket. So sometimes you don't have room to get a socket on a nut in something, and so these, these, huh? Is that a plain nut? No, they're usually <coughs> crimped, uh -huh. crimped a little bit. And is, what, is it like, like, can handle the same load and stuff, or? Apparently, when yeah. Crimped, is it like, if you look at it, it's kind of bulky too? Yeah, yep, a little bit. Okay. We'll go back to this. All right, so high temp nuts or semi high temp. These words, my, oh, Michael, he's missing. He was quiet for a reason. All right, high temp nuts. No, that is not what I wanted to write. Sorry, I skipped too many. So don't write that. Let's start all over again. All right, we'll do this. All metal. All metal, sometimes called high temp. but they're not really high temp. So we have the MS 21045, 21045, which is also called the AN 363s. Those are the ones that are um, slotted and then as those right there. I don't know. I When we did the conversion from A to MS that day, I was off. So, I know. Probably that's what happened. Okay, uh, we'll say pinched end to grip the bolt. So it's got a pinched, pinched end to grip the bolt. Are they reusable? Nope. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> 
There's no data on that. Minimum prevailing torque values for reuse self-locking nuts. Is it a self-locking nut? Yeah. Yeah. So as long as it's on this chart, you're good to go. What if it's not on this chart? You're out of luck. You're out of luck. Can you just squeeze it? Yes, just squeeze it again, as long as you have the data. MS 21046, 21046, um, and it uses is and I called it out of round out of round end it's pinched a little bit <clears throat> um, for both of these we'll put the, this is both so this applies to both then you must have you must have how many threads at least one full thread, one full thread showing past the end, one full thread showing. Is there an AM number for MS-21046? I don't think so. Or let's just say, I don't know it. Um, let's see. And these are both for use for use where temps, where temps do not exceed, do not exceed 450 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's pretty much everywhere on at least a general aviation aircraft except for the exhaust. You just can't use it literally to hold the exhaust on to the cylinders, which is where a lot of people use these nuts. Uh, don't, it's not a good thing. So higher than that, the CAD plating, I'll write that. So um, over 450 degrees, uh, the CAD plating, the CAD plating bakes into the base metal. Metal. And the nut becomes brittle. And not for use. Um, where subject to rotation. I would say the same thing applies here also about the, if the nut came loose, it could get ingested into the engine and all that stuff. But, and also, that's correct. All right, then we get into the high temp nuts. Uh, where they are used on exhaust, used on exhaust. So what I told you, we call them high temp. So I would kind of look for this. It would be low temp, high temp, and then exhaust nuts is probably how you're going to get them. People call it, but I wrote it more proper. Used on exhaust and. So a lot of sorry, a lot of people refer to them as exhaust nuts. Yeah, you just call them exhaust nuts, the high temp. And using our exhaust and where temps are over 450 degrees. Um, can these exhaust temps or exhaust nuts really go to? What, what, what? 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 Like the, yeah, the, the yeah. temperature. Oh, what's the temp? Yeah. Well, exhaust is going to run damn near 2,000 degrees, so Jesus. over 1,500. So there you go, over 1,500 degrees. These are the, the uh, continental ones. They're just made of brass. Yeah. And those are crimped as well? Nope. No? Nope. But they're very long. So they gauge a lot of threads. So it's really just a... And you don't use lock washers with these, which is kind of weird. Uh, Lycoming tends to use lock washers, stainless steel. They like to go stainless steel and use lock washers. These just screw up there with nothing. I mean, you got a little... Down yep. Uh, this is a good point to bring up right here. Let me pull this. Most nuts 
Well, if it's a if it's a self locking nut, you can see which way it goes on. But if it's not, if it's a regular nut, or sometimes engine nuts, cylinder based nuts, see how the washer is kind of built in. All right, well, it's not really a built-in washer because that nut, as it turns, is still going to wipe across whenever you're, you're bolting together. And that's still not good. But when you don't use a washer, at least have the decency to put that side right there up against the part. It just makes it look like you know what you're doing. If you do it on the other side, you can see this one here is the other way around. See how it doesn't have the little washer built in? The little washer right there. And just put it on so it looks like there's a washer up there. It just makes it makes you look better. All right, so those are the high temps. Let me see. Ah, uh, then we go into the castellated nuts. And just like with the high temp, you've got the tension and the shear. So here's the tension, the 310 tension, and the 320 shear. Now look how many threads you've got on there, like one and a half. These things do not handle any type of torquing at all. I mean, you just go to the minimum and hope you make it. So speaking of that, because you didn't have, online 309 has, has a lot more of this stuff. So when you're given a torque range in that chart, which torque do you, you pick? Let's see. Keep scrolling. The hell is it? There it is, okay. All right. So if I'm going to do a 5 16 24 tension, I got 100 to 140. Which torque would I pick? Guys, airplanes are going to fall out of the sky. Yep. Okay, so it's 100 to 140. Let's see. 100 to 140. That is the torque limit recommended for installation. Here's the maximum allowable. So 100 to 140, 225. So really, you can go 100 to 225, right? Sure. Yeah, there you can. So, pen. so that's 100 all the way to 225. So recommended is 100 to 140, 100 to 140, as high as 225. So if I was gonna do a 365 self, uh, self lock low temp, what, what would you pick? I would go 140, maybe 200, I don't know, depending on what I'm doing, I just like it a little bit tighter. There's some drag torque in it, so you have to remember that. So it takes torque to move those nuts because of the self-locking feature. Technically speaking, you should figure out what that torque is and add it. So if you're gonna to go to the minimum, and it was say 10 pounds to pull it, your minimum should be 110. So I tend to go a little bit on the higher side, and I look at it just like that. It's gotta be 100 to 225. Then I'll probably go, well, you know, recommended high is 140. Uh, you know, look at the torque edge. Maybe I'll go 150 or 160, something like that, Once maybe 200. Once you max, though, don't you have more of a chance of just stripping it out? No, it should handle that. It should handle that? Especially if you're using a tension nut. If, it, if it's stripping out, something's wrong. Your torque wrenches, they're made to do that. All right, but if you have a castellated nut and you have to put a cotter pin in it, what are you going to torque it to? Minimum. I'm going to start right here at 100. So I'm going to torque it to 100 and then see if the cotter pin lines up. If it doesn't, I'm going to put my torque wrench to 225 and then turn it, look, and turn it, look, and keep turning until either the torque wrench tells me I hit 225 or the cotter pin fit. So what happens if the torque wrench clicks at 225 and I'm still on? Take it off and try it again. Take it off, get a different nut, get a different bolt, get a different washer. Usually the best way to do it is just change it out for a different nut. All right. Uh, no, <laughs> no good stories of cotter pins. They're just, there they are. Um, oh, so I have to laugh at this one. So I had one smart ass in my class. So you got castellated nut. Oh, okay, before I move on to that. Mind you this. Okay, what is a stud? Threads on both sides, no head on one side. So you actually use a special tool and you screw it into something and what you're left with is, imagine this is a stud. So it's got threads all the way down and I screwed it into something and I got threads sticking out, all right? And then it's got a hole in it. So I put a castellated nut and a cotter pin. What have I just made? Big bolt. I made a big bolt. 
because if you think about it, I could put a wrench right on this and start unscrewing it, and it'll screw the entire stud out. So I'll be looking at a castellated nut with a cotter pin and a washer and threads. And everybody follow that in your own mind. It's really important. So you cannot use a cotter pin on a stud ever because then you just made a bolt. And if they wanted a bolt, they would have gave you a bolt. They wanted it safe. So you have to run safety wire through anytime you do that. But anyway, so we have the self-locking nuts and the castellated nuts. And I had a smart ass say, how come they don't make a self-locking castellated nut? And I said, would you look at that? <laughs> For when it absolutely positively has to stay put, I don't know what the... I've never seen one of these. I've never used one of these. Um, I don't know why. 680 at Landry Actuator has one. Uh, shallow, though. But why? Because uh, you can't have the actuator leaving. You can't have a lot of parts leaving on an airplane, but they don't put <laughs> the list of parts that you're allowed to have fall off an airplane. It's pretty short. Well, I mean, that's the reason you can't have it leaving the plane. And, and yet, and yet they don't use these. So <laughs> yeah, it was probably a joke just to make somebody crazy. All right. So castellated nuts. Let's see. Castellated nuts. Uh, we got 2013. Oh, great. These are nuts designed to be used. Yes. So, uh, on top of the uh, castellated nylon uh, nut, you also have to put sealant on top of that. All right, well, the grown-ups are talking right now, so we'll get back to that. <laughs> Sorry, I just waiting all day to use that one. All right, and that's used with a drilled, a drilled shank. A bolt or uh, stud. Um, nut is secured with a cotter pin. Nut is secured with a cotter pin. Let me see. Oh yeah, we'll write this one. If the nut, if the nut goes onto a stud, comma, safety wire must be used. Safety wire must be used, or you've just created a bolt, and not a very good one. It is used on items, used on items, subject to rotation. We have the AN310, which is the tension. That's the tall one. And the AN320, which is shear which is short. All right, that brings us to plain nuts. Well, they're all plain nuts, aren't they? <laughs> Notice the little raised area. That is the side that goes down. Okay, but when you're using these, you have to use washers and you usually use lock washers because otherwise they'll fall off. So I know a lot of you on your projects, you have drilled head bolts and then you'll put an AM315 and you'll say, well, I say, how does the safety look? Well, you use safety wire. Well, you can't safety the head because the nut would fall off the bottom. But the same way we have the AM315 stick and the AM316, the thin ones, and use them with a lock washer. So that is plain nuts. Um, must be used, must be used with a lock washer, a lock washer or palmet. I'll show you palmets. So we've got the 
AN315, those are tension. And the AM316, which are shear. And now I said pal nuts. We'll talk about pal nuts. Um, pal nuts are one time use. Use them and throw them away. Pal nut. Picture pal nut. Better. Pal nuts. So these are pal nuts. They're just thin stamped nuts. I mean, look at, there's really not any threads, but these are just tags or just spaced apart and, and angled just right. So they kind of make threads and it's a jam nut is what you usually call them. So you can see you've got a nut right here and they just ran the pal nut right over it. And in theory, that second nut jammed on top of it keeps the first nut from backing out, which is hard to believe. Cause like I said, they're just thinly stamped little things. You don't even reuse them. You know, you take them off and you throw them away and you put a new one on. I honestly have not seen a pal nut used on a modern aircraft at all, but antique engines use the crap out of them. I mean, you use a hundred of these things to hold, hold them together. Just everything had a pal nut on it. It was crazy. Even on things that modern engines, they don't even safety, uh, cylinder based uh, uh, nuts and stuff like that. They'll put a pal nut on it. So, um, you see this right here? So it's kind of worth mentioning, I think, right there. There was actually an airworthiness directive on Cessnas to do this. So what you have is a bolt that is going through. This is a, a heim joint. It's got a ball joint in it. They're called heim joints. And so it's got a bolt going through this joint, coming through here, and it's nutted. And then they put a pal nut on it to safety it, which is all good and well. Um, but then they put a large area washer, the AN970 large area washer. And the reason why that is, on Cessnas, they wanted you to do it because if that joint failed, that what was left, there's, there's a ball. I wonder if I have a picture of that. I think I do. So that little bearing is inside there. And if for some reason this broke and the, the, there we go, and the bearing fell out, if you just had a bolt, the bolt only just barely covers about the outer diameter of this inner ball that rotates. And so in theory, what's left, this larger piece right here, could just slide right over the bolt head. And then whatever you had is the bolt, it just, the rod is off and the bolt's over here and nothing works and it all falls apart. So what Cessna wanted you to do is put a large area washer, which now captures that. So if this whole thing broke and the ball broke, at least you'd have, it would be sloppy, but forward would still be forward and back would still be back. And you'll learn more about this, but see this, that little hole right there? It's called a witness hole. And this is threaded down into here and you can't see how far it's threaded, right? So you have a witness hole that basically says that this has to be threaded in past that hole. So you take a piece of safety wire and you try and put it in that hole. And if you can put it through the hole, you didn't screw it in far enough. So you have to keep screwing it in until the safety wire does not go in. This one down here, I hope isn't a witness hole because there's safety wire in it. So anyway, there we go. Uh, pal nuts, you got one time use. And axe is a jam nut, so axe as a jam nut. On top of another. All right, that brings me to washers. There it is, I don't think I have it. I don't have it off the top of my head. It's in your little book. I didn't write it. Anybody got their book? Michael? Got it. Yeah, you can tell me what that is. 
All right. Washers. Washers are almost always used under a nut and usually on top of the head of a bolt too. So I, if I'm going to bolt something together, I'm going to put it under the head of the bolt and definitely underneath the nut so uh, to protect the parts. So washers are almost always used um, under a nut to protect the part. From being damaged by rotating nut the part. The part from, yes. To answer Tobias's question of how nuts part number is MS two seven one five one. MS two seven one fifty one. His old part number was AC three fifty six. Ooh, AC three fifty six. Whoa, got AC. That's some old stuff. Um, when you get into AC, I've never seen AC other than um, fittings, which I don't do fittings. Those blue fittings, those are called AN fittings. Well, for precursor, that was AC fittings. They had a different uh, shoulder on them. Really old. Under nut to protect the part from being damaged. I think that was all I wanted to say. No, by rotating nut. By. Yeah. Well, back then they weren't called antique engines, they were just called engines. <laughs> uh, so washers are almost used under a part, to, under a nut to protect the part from being damaged by rotating that. So I could put, um, well, I'm not gonna write it, but the exception is usually steel on steel. If it's a steel part, you'll often see they didn't use a washer because it's a steel nut on a steel part, it's usually exempt. But otherwise, everything else is aluminum. You got a steel nut, Rotating against the aluminum, it's going to tear it up. So you got to put a washer on there. You'll hear me get all excited if you don't use a washer. I'll be like, what are you doing? Uh, B. So washers, oh man, now they have these crazy numbers. NAS1149. Um, I know them as the AN960. Um, for the AN960 dash some number L for light. So that is your standard washer. Standard use washer. All right, nice question. Let me go up to my washers here. Pal nuts, washers. So you got your, I'm just going to call them AN960s because that's what I know. Standard thickness, heavy CAD plated steel flat washer and AN960 half thickness light CAD washer. When would you choose one over the other? Well, let's say you're bolting something together and you get all done. And how do you know if you bolted it together correctly? You're looking at it. You got your washers. You got your nut. You got red sticking out. How many? At least one. What if you only have half? That's not good. Then use a thin washer. What if you use a thin washer and you still don't have enough? Use a thin washer on the other side. How about if you still don't have enough? Then you need a longer bolt. Then you're gonna have to get washers. Then you're gonna have to add a couple. Then you need to. So sometimes you're in that thing. So these are just AN 960 standard washers, light and thick. And then there's the 970, the large area washer, which I was kind of showing you before, where we used them on the Heim joint. And, and uh, in automotive, they call these fender washers, but we're not in automotive, so we won't. So standard use washer, and then we had the C, the AN 970, um, large area. And of course, all of these, like I wrote here, the AN960 dash, you know, XXX, that's a number. So like a 416 or the 516, I think. They all have different numbers on the end to tell you what number it is. And the number corresponds to the bolt size. So everything just matches up real nice. 
Um, lock washers. All right, so whenever you use a plain nut, you have to use a lock washer. Would you use a lock washer with a self-locking nut? You could. Could, if everybody think you're kind of weird, so don't do it. Doesn't say you can't, it's just, why would you do that? Twice as safe. It's twice as safe, yes. <laughs> lock washers. So the lock washer goes between, and this is what, to me, it, it seems kind of silly. So, well, if I could draw, draw decent. So we're gonna put, you know, a flat washer, and then we're gonna put our, our lock washer, which are split, so we'll put a little split there. Then a lock washer, then the nut. So we got the nut, the lock washer, and then the regular washer. and then the part that you're bolting underneath that. But the whole funny thing is, if you look at it, it's like, well, then what keeps just this washer and the nut as a unit from undoing? But they don't. So the lock washer obviously works, but you never, ever, ever put the lock washer and allow it to dig in to your aircraft part. Never, never seen that. That would be bad, bad, bad. So lock washers. Go between, go between the nut and flat washer. There are different kinds. We have the split lock. I like split locks the most. What's your favorite kind of washer? Mine is the split lock. <laughs> oh, and I stole this from www.laserarrow.com. Thank you, laserarrow.com. Your source for all, all good lock washers. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> I give credit where credit is due. I steal stuff. Yes. Uh, okay, I like split locks better because they're reusable to a point. So you see how it's all split and it's sprung? As long as it's still split and, well, it's always going to be split. As long as it's still a spring like that and it's not flat, then you can reuse it. So even if it's like, what if it's like part of the way? Or is there like a limit? Like there's no limit. It's no. just, it's, if there's, as, long as, they're, as long as they're not flat, you can reuse them. But the other one are star locks, I call them. So there's internal and external, internal, external. These are my least favorite. Those are my... just and I don't know who decides what usually I only see external on small screws it's yeah like screws up to like a number eight maybe a ten and then if it's a bolt I see external and then well continental and most you know, continental definitely uses splits Lycoming uses star locks this one and these are just small screws that I see from time to time. And that's about it. Uh, over here. So split lock. We have the MS35338 or the AN935 and they can be reused. If they are not flat when removed. And then we got the star lock. They cannot be reused at all. Uh, we got the internal teeth. MS35333 and the external.
MS35335. Oh, and when you're using these, what size or how do you measure them? So these are easy. You're going to measure the inside circle. These are a little bit harder because you would measure inside the teeth. It it's all depends on what kind of bolt fits in. So a number four, uh, uh, AN4 would have to have a MS35333-4, whatever it is. Yeah, hopefully that made sense. All right, screws. Screws get a little complicated because there's so many different types of heads and screws. So first thing you know is some are structural and some are not. So like on my airplane, I have a lot of inspection panels down the wing and you know, belly of the airplane uh, as most Cessnas do. And those are held on with three screws, sometimes more depending on where it is. But they're just like my plane, I just use stainless steel screws. I use aircraft hardware, but they're just plain old, simple stainless steel screws. They're not structural. Those are not structural components. So you can really get away with just about any kind of screw you want to without it being, it being a problem. But if I was going to, uh, sometimes you have inspection plates that actually carry stress through them, and then you'll find they do have structural screws. Or I am attaching something inside of the airplane. Let's say I'm attaching um, a ELT, emergency locator beacon, or fire extinguisher, or some component that has to carry weight in case of an, an accident, then you'd want to be using structural screws. You've got to make sure you use the right ones. So let me see, structural screws, what do we got here? Smaller. So screws go four, six, eight, ten. Bolts go from the ten is the same thing, three sixteenths on up. Okay. So uh let's see. Yeah, and there's so many different types of screw heads. So there's the filister, the washer head, the truss head, the pan head, the countersunk. Sort of a You got a favorite? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm definitely, anything with a straight blade or slotted, I hate. And you can go to hell. That's how I feel about that. Because I hate them. Um, so, so my favorite here is I like the good old-fashioned truss head for your non-structural and your washer head for structural. All right. So let me see. I think this works out. So here we go. So a rule of thumb, structural screws will resemble a bolt. See how they got the shoulder right there? And I believe, don't hold me to this one, but there's a little X right there. So these will be structural, number three and number two. Number one, not so much. Number four, definitely not. They're stainless, and these are just stainless countersunk. So, all right, so this was like a test right here, if it works. So which one is the filister? One and one. Oh, which one's the washer head? <laughs> Panhead. Two. Two. Countersunk. Countersunk's easy. Dress head. Yeah, that's kind of hard. It's just, well, it's just. I mean, they look similar. Two and four Two and four? Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. Washer head's obvious. Countersunk's obvious. Um, filister, yeah, a little more obvious. But then after that, it's kind of like, well, I'm not going to test you on that. That was just for fun. Oh, yeah, and this is for fun. Phillips screwdriver has about 30, because there's Phillips and Reed and Prince, and look, notice they look exactly the same. So technically speaking, Phillips screwdriver has about 30-degree flukes and a blunt end, while a Reed and Prince has 45-degree flukes and a sharper pointed end. The Phillips screw has beveled walls between the slots, the Reed and Prince straight pointed walls. In addition, the Phillips screw slot is not as deep as the Reed and Prince. Yeah, just give me either number one or number two Phillips. If they don't come with that, we got problems. So there's the slotted, or as I call them, straight blade, because that's what I just, the Torx head, Torx set, which is offset, and the tri-wing. Do you see any of those? I do not see Torx set or tri-wing. I've never really dealt with those much, but I will tell you this, most of the time, they're titanium. 
And when you put titanium, by the way, in a glass bead booth, it's really cool. It's like a shower of sparks. Just so. Without mistake, or did someone tell you that? Oh, it was just found out on my own. <laughs> <laughs> it was just one day I was blasting something, and somebody used one of these screws. So, all right, those, what do we got here? Yeah, five common types of drivers. You got the slotted, the uh, Phillips. Allen, Torx, Robertson Square. I see those in woodworking a lot. Um, the only time I've ever run across, well, you get these two, you get the slotted, I hate them, the uh, Phillips. Yep. Um, rare, I, don't, I can't think of any of these. And Slick Magneto uses three of these. So there you go, there's six of them on my plan. So. What about the... Uh, um, not really, no. not in aviation. Well, it could be there, it's just could be. not what I've experienced. All right, so let's make some notes. Structural, um, same properties as a bolt. It's just a little bolt. And then I would say machine screw. Um, uses machine threads um, so standard threads um, standard threads usable usable in a nut. I don't know if that made sense. And then we have structural machine and you can sometimes call them self-tapping. Um, more common um, in aviation, we call them PK screws. I know. He invented them. That's why we call them PK. So there's your PK style. Notice how the threads are kind of, you wouldn't want to put a nut on that. You can kind of look at it and go, yeah, I'm not putting a nut on that. So these are self-tapping and or PK screws. You're not going to self-tap. Well, you could if the hole's the right size. So, and then back here, we have number three, which was a, um, yeah, but it's a, a structural screw. Number two is probably a structural screw. Number one f and four, they're just um, machine screws. Is that because they have the thread going all the way up? The yeah, it's used, that's what I've noticed. I know it's not written down anywhere, but every time I bought a structural screw, they almost always look just like three or two. They don't usually they look like one. Shoulder. Yep, have a little shoulder. And I would say the reason for that is we talked about good bolting practices when you're bolting something together you're not supposed to have the threads inside the bolted part, right? That's true. Okay, so that little shoulder right there is for the two pieces that are being, that's the grip. And these other ones don't have grip, they're not structural. As where that has a grip, that tells me it's structural, or at least a little more serious of a screw. Uh, the self-tapping, yeah, I call them PK. Um, The machine, I'll put this here, comes in number four, six, eight, and 10, which is the same as a 3 16 And the self-tapping also comes in a four, six, eight, and 10. Although you're not gonna get a nut on there, so I wouldn't call it a 3 16 I would just say it's a number 10. Eh, it's not all inclusive. <laughs> Occasionally you can get a 12 for when everything is kind of yeah, stripped out. So the self-tapping or PK, um, I also call them, I had a whole thing here. I call them sheet metal screws, self-tapping PK. We call them sheet metal screws. Um, I already told you to be PK. 
Um, they use a Tinnerman nut. Use, use a Tinnerman. Of course I do. Tinnerman. Tinnerman nut, right there. So you have a caged Tinnerman nut, you have an uncaged Tinnerman nut, and what always seems to happen with these, which is just a lot of fun, is one of these little tangs will break off after years of use, and then the nut just stripped out, basically. You put the nut in, it doesn't tighten up. It tightens a little tiny bit, and you gotta take everything apart, find out which one's broken, and then fix that. So what do I hear? Yeah, there is type A and B. Type A is pointy. Type B is not. Truss head Phillips, sometimes called PK screw. PK stands for Parker Kalon. Yeah, and I love the part number. That's a 10, number 10, RX1 THA. This is a number 10, type 1, one inch long. I'm not going to write that down. They also come in countersink. Um, oh, I see what I did here. I go into more detail, so. I'll do that. So I said E, sheet metal. Sheet metal screws. Uh, may be called, may be called a PK screw. Uh, uses a Tinnerman nut. There's caged, uncaged Tinnerman nuts. Uh, comes in different styles with both truss head and countersunk. So maybe truss head, or countersunk. not used for structural assemblies. So usually just trim or inspection covers or something like that. I move over. Michael's not here to yell at me. It's just not the same without them. Okay, the machine screws. Um, well, they have all different kinds of heads. We already looked at that. Um, they are also not used for structural, unless they're the structural screw. Um, they do not have a grip, so entire length is threads, or are threads. Um, they come in machine thread is number four, which is 4-40. Four um, number six, 632. Number eight, eight, 832. And number 10, which is um, 3 16 which is also 1032. Oh, I I missed a page. It's fine, I covered it all, definitely. Okay, break time. <laughs> 